On December 7, 1941, which was a Sunday, I was playing blackjack at the home of a friend of mine. We were 18 years old, or 19, 18 years old. And while we were playing this game, because before the war, if you lived in Brooklyn and Coney Island, you really had not much to do with Saturdays and Sundays. It was still a depression. And we were low-income families. And we heard that there had been an attack on Pearl Harbor. None of us knew where Pearl Harbor was. We knew what an attack was. And my reaction was this, are they crazy? to attack the United States of America, they'll be wiped out in two or three days. Yeah, I was at Cornell University and uh, on the Cornell Sun, which was also Ithaca's morning newspaper. And, uh, well, we did not ordinarily get out a Sunday edition, uh, but when I heard over the radio that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, we. I went tearing downtown where the Sun offices were, and some others arrived, and we got out the Saturday edition with a new front page. Uh, we had AP and, and UP service, and very soon after the news of the attack came over the radio, uh, we got a flash from Drew Pearson listing the ships that had been sunk at Pearl Harbor. And then we heard from what was then called the War Department, I believe, uh, saying we do not have the right to ask you not to publish these figures, but we do ask you, please, as good citizens, not to. And so very soon, uh, very soon after the news of the attack got out, we found out, and I guess every newspaper must have found out, what the losses were there, and that was in fact kept a secret. I think we knew at that time, what I was, high, I was sophomore, I guess, a college sophomore, I guess we all knew we would get in the war sooner or later, as this came as quite a surprise. As one fraternity brother of mine was in the bathtub and heard the news and slipped and head, hit his head on the faucet of the bathtub somehow and he was rendered unfit for military service. <laughs> were, you, uh, were you a journalism major? Uh, no, I was a biochemist, but I, I, my whole time was spent getting out the sun, which was an in, in, totally independent of the university and a successful corporation. We all knew we were gonna go uh, by 41, though. Uh, it was a, even then it was a question of how soon we'd go is how much more college we'd get before we had to go. How did you get in? I, I, had, I had the same feeling he did. Uh, the feeling was that sooner or later we would get into the war, but I had no idea what war was, and I still have only a sketchy idea of what war was in, in World War II. Uh, I was not upset by it. I was young and ignorant and optimistic. Now I'm old and ignorant and optimistic. <laughs> uh, how I got into the war was that at a certain point, uh, I, I, uh, the government said they would, be, would begin drafting 19 year, old, 19 year olds. At that time, if you enlisted, you could theoretically choose your branch of service. Uh, I and a group of us in Coney Island wanted very much to get away from Coney Island, to do something more exciting. So we, when Roosevelt made that announcement, the government did, we persuaded our parents to let us go enlist. And at the age of 19, or a little before 19, we went down to, we went uptown to, to Manhattan uh, and volunteered to enlist. And I chose the Air Corps because it seemed more glamorous, less dirty uh, uh, th than infantry, uh, less claustrophobic than being in a submarine or a tank. So I chose the Air Corps and that's how I got into the Army. Well, I... 
uh, as Stephen said, we were stockpiled as college graduates, or college kids, undergraduates, were stockpiled in a thing called ASTP. I was sent to the University of Tennessee and to Carnegie Mellon. And they, they did, they, I, I wonder how long they knew they were going to use this for riflemen, but it was, uh, <laughs> anyway, we were simply stockpiled, and then I was pulled out and sent to this, the 106th Division, which had been on maneuvers in South Carolina, and after maneuvers, as all their privates and PFCs uh, were sent to, rep sent to replacement depots, but the power structure was completely intact as all the officers and all the non-coms, including the mail orderly. And so we all arrived in a division uh, where there was no hope for promotion whatsoever. And uh, you say we were given uh, infantry training. I wasn't. It's, I really have a lawsuit against the government because <laughs> my basic training was on the 240 millimeter howitzer. <laughs> which fires, fires a 350-pound bomb uh, about six or seven miles. Uh, and it's a lot of work. You have to build it like a building, uh, putting it all together before you can fire it. Uh, I had the only weapon uh, I had been trained, the Army had trained me to use, 45, and, and the carbine. And so then I was sent to the 106th Division with no infantry training, and made a battalion scout. Uh, and fortunately, my father was a gun nut, so I had a pretty good idea of how all this crap worked. <laughs> but I was, I, I was utterly untrained, and it didn't really didn't make any any uh, difference. It was the 106th Division. There were not only the college kids, but people who'd been let out of jail. Uh, given, the given the opportunity to make their country proud of them instead of ashamed. And uh, there were t very sickly people, uh, very poor physical specimens, as the model for Billy Pilgrim in my, my great novel, Slaughterhouse Five. Uh, <laughs> uh, was a kid named Joe Crone who grew up in Rochester, New York, and he was a uh, sophomore at Hobart when the Army called him up, and he was indeed, as I described him, uh, he had shoulders and a chest like a box of kitchen matches. This person was about 6'4", but this uh, very uh, lousy body and practically no shoulders. And another thing I said about him was that uh, he didn't look anything like a soldier. He looked like a filthy flamingo. <laughs> and, but by God, he was in the 106th Division with the rest of us. And in prison in Dresden, uh, he died uh, of the 5,000-mile stare, which is what prisoners of war get sometimes, is they will sit, Joe sat down. Uh, we were sent to work every day. He wouldn't go to work anymore, and, but he wouldn't get up off the floor either with his back against the wall, and we couldn't get him to get food, and we couldn't get him to a hospital, and he finally starved to death uh, with, when the war had about, I don't know, six weeks to go, I guess. Uh, but I spoke in Rochester it was five days ago and uh, visited the tomb of, of Joe Crone, and his parents had gone over and retrieved his body and found it in Dresden and uh, buried it there in Rochester. And that closed out the war for me as far as I was concerned. As I, uh, but he never should have been in the Army. Many of us, I should have been in the Army. That's fine. I, my health was good, but God, we had some sickly people. Joe, how did you get into the Army Air Corps? You well, I, you went down and signed up, and then walk us through what I, happened next. I, I enlisted, uh, and, and then... Uh, Went through the physical, stepped forward, and uh, was in the army. And then a week or two later, went up by subway with my three friends to, uh, to report for duty. And did, and five days later, I never had basic training either, but I never needed it. Uh, five days later, I was put on a, a, a troop train, no idea where we were going and gathered that we're going south because it was getting hotter and sunnier. This was in October. 
went to Florida, Miami, Florida, where I took a number of aptitude tests, and then got on a train again for six or seven days and got off at Lowry Field, Colorado, and found out I had been assigned to be trained as an armorer. Now, I had never heard that word before then uh, and didn't know what it was, but I was trained at Lowry Field as an armorer. Enjoyed myself there enormously, by the way. In fact, I enjoyed everything in the army about, except about the last uh, month or two and a half of, of, of combat duty. Uh, and while I was there at Lowry Field, where they were training aerial gunners to use the turret, I was being trained to uh, fix machine guns, a 50 cal machine gun, a 30 cal machine gun. They wanted aviation cadets. Now, before the war, uh, I think to be an aviation cadet required a college education. I had no college education. But I, I applied, I took the test, I passed, and then I was sent to California, given more medical tests, found out I had no depth perception, so I could not be a pilot which I didn't care about, I just wanted to, uh, whatever they asked me to do, I did in the Army. Uh, they said enlist, enlist, they said be, apply for aviation cadets, I did. Uh, so I was a bombardier, and I was trained as a bombardier, and eventually I was sent overseas, flew the B-25, which is as, as big as from there to here, uh, o overseas flew in the B-25, I wasn't a pilot, and wound up on, in Corsica with a, a tactical, tactical Air Force squadron, and luckily I came at just the right time for me. That, that squadron had been through a very difficult time just before I joined them, with, with the Battle of Monte Cassino and Anzio, uh, and after I left them, they moved them to the mainland, and uh, they had another difficult time, and, and there I was, a bombardier in the, uh, on the Riviera, practically. Uh, earning more money than I ever thought I would earn as a, as a second lieutenant with flight pay. Flying missions which I thought then were very s largely safe, relatively safe and easy. When I look back on it now, I don't think I would do it again. <laughs> There's a... a, a, a in, 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 the, in the British uh, Royal Air Force, they figured out by 1943 and told the heavy bomber boys and even the medium bomber boys, listen, take those machine guns out of there, get all that ammo out of there, get those bodies out of there, you'll be lighter, faster, you can fly higher, and you're going to be safe. And they all said, bullshit, we want to shoot back. Yeah. <laughs> that, that idea of flying up there and not being able to shoot back. When I read, I, I have a book, it's called The History of the Eighth Air Force. But I, before I, I enlisted, I was reading about the Eighth Air Force missions. One of them was that awful mission to a uh, ball bearing factory where they lost 60 planes. Now, uh, there are roughly 10 men in a plane. So there's 600 men in one mission to, uh, uh, to Schweinfurt, uh, was named. When I read this, the, the story of the Eighth Air Force, my blood turns cold. And, and I feel that if I had been assigned to the Eighth Air Force, I would have collapsed in fear. Now, I would not have, uh, uh, because I didn't know what the dangers were then. And as I say, I was uh, uh, conditioned psychologically to do whatever I was told. But they went through a horrible, horrible experience in the Eighth Air Force. And, and when I first met Mr. Vonnegut, the first time I met you was at Notre Dame, you, you gave one of the best speeches I ever heard centered on Indiana, but you talked about, you did mention you wanted to write about Dresden and had not been able to. I had never heard about the bombing of Dresden. Now, this is 1966, 67. Uh, and then Slaughterhouse Five was published, uh, and I did know about it. Uh, I shudder at the experiences that other people had that you write about uh, in D-Day that Mr. Vonnegut could tell me about but doesn't want to uh, as a POW. David Craig, whom you mentioned, uh, was in the infantry, was taken prisoner, was escaped, uh, got a bronze star for knocking out a Tiger tank. And when I met him, he gave me information which I did use in closing time and then was wounded. Uh, all of that now, if I had known then that this could have happened to me, I don't know if I could have summoned up the courage to go into the service. Yeah. And 
Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Is it yeah. Uh, it, for me, it, it was a great adventure. I mean, it was the goddamnedest trip anybody ever took. And uh, I was so lucky for two reasons. One, I was captured. <laughs> uh, <laughs> two, I was a, uh, I was private. And under the Geneva Convention, relative to the treatment of the prisoners of war, is privates and PFCs must work for their keep. And so non-coms and officers were stuck out in the countryside uh, with each other for company, really, and, and playing chess and teaching other languages and all that. The privates got sent into town. We got sent into Dresden before it was bombed as, as we were working in a, in a malt factory, making malt syrup for uh, packing, malt syrup for pregnant women, that sort of thing. We saw a hell of a lot of Germans. We saw German life every day. Uh, we saw slave laborers, his Poles. Uh, we met we met prisoners uh, from all over the place, as New Zealanders, uh, Australians, uh, Yugoslavians, either royalists or communists, and so forth. And boy, it was a swell trip. And uh, let's I, not go quite so fast. Yeah. Take us across the Atlantic with you and land us and, 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 and walk us up to December right. 16th of 44. The, hundred, the Hungry and Sick Division, also known as the Bag Lunch Division, uh, <laughs> went on the Queen Elizabeth uh, without escort uh, across the Atlantic Ocean because it was the fastest thing on the ocean and it could outrun. It could take the escorts. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we put in at Le Havre. Uh, or not at Le Havre, we, we, we put in at England first, spent about two weeks there, uh, then went over to France, spent about two weeks there, then went into the line, uh, taking over positions. Did you truck up to the yeah, Belgium we from did. Le Havre? Uh, we camped for a while in, in France, is, is uh, uh, maybe 50 miles inland, I guess. Uh, but I understand. There are highs, as I, I can understand the appeal of war. Is I was, one, I was with people I knew because I'd been with the division for a while before we went overseas, and these college kids too, is my kind of people. Uh, going up to the front in blacked out trucks with our steel helmets on and with our M1s like this, with a bandit stud man so forth in the dark and we all knew each other and we were going right to the front jesus it felt wonderful, wonderful yeah. holy smokes is uh if only my wedding night had been like that <laughs> you were so you were you were 21 years old? Yeah. And this was about the 13th of December, 12th of December? Yeah, we, uh, we didn't last very long. And, and of course, well, don't, don't go so fast. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, we took over these positions. Yeah, all uh, right, so you're on, you're on the Siegfried line in, our, in the yeah. Ardennes, and yeah. they told you it's very quiet here, nothing That's to worry right. about. That's right. We talked to second division guys as they were leaving. And what they'd had, uh, one casualty is a Jeep accident, I guess the previous week, something like that. And uh, I was in battalion headquarters as I was not only battalion scout, but the bodyguard for our uh, commander. Uh, and we didn't know really how bad it was or what it was like to be on the front. And things got bad very fast. Now they went around us because I didn't see the spearhead of the attack. And uh, finally, we were flying blind is, is as battalion scout, one of the jobs we were given with the six battalion scouts in a, in a battalion headquarters. I was sent to find out what, we, we were sent to find out what the hell had happened to the artillery. <laughs> what the hell had happened to anything. And finally, we were looking for just anybody. And uh, we did get fired on, and finally the order came down uh, where we, that we were to surrender, which I guess was the largest surrender of Americans under arms 
in American military history as our regimental commander ordered us to surrender. Well, this is an illegal order. It's like ordering a soldier to shoot himself, that you cannot do that. And so we did not wish to. And uh, uh, s several of us set out to find out where the hell we were. Where, and uh, uh, we wandered around as we'd be fired on every so often. Uh, the Germans were mopping up, and the real front line must have been, I don't know, 20, 30 miles away. Behind you. Yeah. Yeah, behind you? Beyond us. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, the Germans had a mopping up operation. Uh, these parties out hunting for pockets of Americans here and there, and we finally wound up in a creek bed, which was sort of a natural trench. And uh, we're loudspeakers. They said they knew where we were. Was, How many of you? Oh, 10, 12. Uh, at that time, I... All headquarters personnel or mixed? No, we had a doctor, we had a couple of anti-tank guys. It was just, whoever wanted to take off, let's go. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the loudspeaker, they said uh, they knew where we were. In good English was this? Uh, good enough for us. <laughs> 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 and uh, come out. And... Uh, bring your weapons with you. So we didn't. And so they just fired tree bursts in as we were, and uh, some of us were hit, not me, thank God. Uh, anyway, uh, we finally decided a pretty good idea, and we took our rifles apart and threw the parts all over the place. But I, when I saw Desert Storm, which is the worst first war that's fun, you know, war is a whoopee cushion, uh, when I saw those Turkey or those Iraqi soldiers like this, and these are Iraqi kids, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, just what we were then, like this, many of them wounded, hungry, scared to death, having been shelled and shelled and machine gunned and everything else with nothing to fight back with, I said, those are my brothers because I had seen American kids, as far as you could see, look this way, headed away from the battle. And going down the road, the other side of the road, we, they took us down the shoulder of the road. Uh, what, it, it must have been, it was two of our regiments, maybe 10,000 people, something like that. It was a big surprise to them, too. Uh, going the other way, well, boy, these young, tough-looking troops riding on tanks and so forth, they, they, they really had, they were really good-looking soldiers. And I guess they practically all got killed, didn't they? Or captured. Yeah. Because yeah. they just, uh, yeah. they, their flanks were completely undefended. But it was a wonderful invent, uh, adventure, and I really wouldn't have missed it for anything. When, when did your feeling change? When you were, when you were taken prisoner, yeah. Were you still feeling high? And, and oh, good? no, 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 I, no, that, that, that high lasted, it was like crack, how long does that high last? About, <laughs> about, about three hours. Okay. But also, another thing that, uh, uh, that Iraq r reminded me of was that, you know, the Air Force says a turkey shoot when they went after the recruiting, retreating Iraqis in their vehicles. And that happened to us, too is a uh, number of our vehicles, just in the confusion, it's, it's, we were trying to regroup to find out what the hell was going on. We had a lot of, of vehicles all in one place. And then the order was given, all right, well, let's pull out. And the 88s were waiting for them, and the, the truck would go out on the road and pow, and pow, and pow, and, and uh, we lost several trucks, and, and uh, whoever was in charge, decided this was a bad idea finally and uh, so so we set about uh, sabotaging the the vehicles uh, when the, so you were in that ditch uh, the, the act of surrender how did they they're calling you guys don't come they fire the tree burst you yeah, finally yeah. decided it's hopeless you break up your weapons and then what you came out like this yeah. or with a white flag or I mean that's always a critical no. moment how do you safely get taken POW yeah well I think they were glad to have no trouble. 
and uh, yeah, that was it, and that was their job uh, to round us up. And uh, then we returned. They were young guys who were after us with much better weapons than we had. Incidentally, is when we got beat. Is the Germans were much better equipped, and they were. What the Germans had white capes. They had, had whitewashed their tanks and their vehicles. Everything we had was the color of dog shit, and we were fighting in the snow. <laughs> Let's leave you there now at the moment of capture and go back to Corsica. <laughs> and you had what you have said were milk runs, and you didn't have a sense well, of danger until Avignon, which yeah. was your 35th mission? 37th mission, but be between zero and 37, there were a, a large number of very, very dangerous missions, but I was too young and too inexperienced to realize how dangerous they were. Most of those were at a bridge north of the city of Ferrara. I'd never heard of Ferrara. If I had heard of Po Valley, it was in the course of geography in, in the fourth or fifth grade. They were very, very dangerous, and one plane was shot down and a man in my, in, my, in my tent went with it. If I had had to fly those missions after the Avignon missions, I think I would have cracked up because I would go along in the, uh, and watch the flak come so close to our plane, the other planes, and the closer the burst came, the more I'd like it. It was like being in a movie. Uh, I did not know I was at war. I did not know that people could be killed. I did not know that people wounded would be in pain. I did not know that. Uh, I was not college educated. I had not read D-Day. I had not read Slaughterhouse-Five. I had not read, read about war. Had you read All Quiet on the Western Front? No. And I hadn't, seen, and I hadn't seen the movie, but uh, I don't think that would have convinced me. Uh, I do think that the, probably for very good reasons, the information released publicly about the war was information that played down the deaths. We had casualty lists. We never saw photographs of dead people. We never saw photographs of mutilated uh, people. Uh, and uh, my only experience of the war was, uh, was what came from Hollywood, I suppose. I was young. I was stupid. I was optimistic. I was idealistic as well. Uh, we're talking now about you know, celebrating the anniversary of something that was victorious on a historical level. On a personal level, it was a very, very serious, a very tragic, uh, very tragic experience from Pearl, from Pearl Harbor on. I did not know that. I, uh, I know it now. I did not hate anybody in the war. I never had an officer that I disliked or I felt was unjust or incompetent. I did not hate Germany. I disliked Hitler because I, I, I knew what he was, and he was anti-Semitic, and I was brought up in a Jewish neighborhood, and all of the parents knew what anti-Semitism was. I, I had only a, a dim appreciation of that. I didn't hate the gunners who were shooting at me because they let me alone. They didn't, they didn't want me. Uh, it was after the war that I went to college, and it was eight years after the war that I began writing Catch-22. I knew much more then than I did at the time. And also, I do believe that the situation in this country after World War II, I began after the Korean War, was very much different than it was during World War II. Uh, George McGovern was a bomber pilot out of Italy. And teaching at UNO's Innsbruck Summer School some years ago, he went down to Vienna to be on a TV show, and he was asked, well, Senator, you're world famous for your opposition to the war in Vietnam, but you were a bomber pilot in World War II. Do you regret that? And George said, no, I've never regretted it. I hated Hitler so much. But there is one bomb that I dropped that I really did regret. He was flying back on a mission, and he had a bomb stuck in the bomb bay, and he had to get rid of it before he could land, and it was stuck there. And he put the crew to work, and finally in the intercom, they come on, Captain, we're ready, we can drop it. He said, drop it. 
And he happened to look at his watch, and it was high noon, and he watched the bomb go down, and it hit a barn next to a farmhouse. And he said on this television show, that bomb I always regretted because I'm a farm boy, and I know that farmers eat at high noon, and I always worried that maybe I would killed some members of that farm family with that bomb. He's leaving the studio, and the phone rings, and somebody comes, a technician comes out, grabs him, and says, Senator, there's somebody here that insists he's got to talk to you. The man came on and he said, Senator, I know from your description that was my barn. <laughs> and I want you to know we were having our noon meal and nobody got hurt. And I thought at that time that if that bomb destroying my little barn shortens this war by one second, it was worth it. <laughs> I'd like to ask you, you were a bombardier yeah. dropping bombs. Yeah. Your thoughts, feelings, emotions, then and now. My, my feelings then were that I, I, I really did not care deeply where my bombs felt. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, of, the, of, of the 60 missions I flew on, 58, well, the t 58 were against bridges, railroad bridges or uh, highway bridges. Uh, one was close support of the, the British Army near Rimini, and we dropped fragmentation bombs, and, uh, and they fell where they were supposed to. Uh, the other one was bombing a village in northern Italy, and in the briefing we were told that the Germans were moving divisions into Italy or out of Italy, and this was a road. and we. Uh, we had to make a roadblock out of that village. That's in Catch-22, where a few of the people protest, and while they're protesting, the officer says, would you rather go back to Bologna, which was a very dangerous target, and they all shut up. So wh when it comes down to that, they would rather go and bomb the village. I bombed that village. Now, I, I should say this, that. Uh, I was a wing bombardier. I didn't aim, the, aim the, the, the bombs, but that's immaterial to your question. It bothered me only in a intellectual way. Uh, I'm, I was sorry we had to do it. I was, it did not disturb me very much. It would bother me, if I were in the Eighth Air Force, British or the British Force, and going out to destroy cities, cities like Dresden, uh, and, and Hamburg and the rest. At the time, I doubt it would disturb me that I was bombing civilians, civilian centers. I doubt very much. If you asked me that now, if I had done it, does it bother me? I would say it did, but it didn't bother me then. It's the same reaction I had to the atom bomb. When the atom bomb went off, I was already out of here. He had a much rougher time than I had, by the way. Well, he was making being taken prisoner. I was flying across the Mediterranean. Uh, it was a little chilly then, of course, it was December. But I was reading about and seeing pictures of the troops buried in snow mm -hmm. uh, there. Uh, I, I had a fleece jacket, and, and, and uh, 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 I, I was very comfortable. I, I lost a train of thought. <laughs> uh, it, would, it, it would not have bothered me very much if I were doing that. Uh, it would bother me now if I had. But again, it would bother me with certain mitigating <coughs> circumstances. With the atom bomb, I was out of the army. Right after VE Day, I was out about, in about three weeks. People seem, uh, don't know that we were, we were discharging soldiers after that. They had a certain number of points. I came out of a racetrack, uh, and I saw a headline, atom bomb dropped, and I rejoiced. And I would rejoice again at it. If you ask me today, how do I feel about it? I would say I am very, very worried about the whole, subs uh, the, the whole subject of atomic energy and atomic weapons. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I rejoiced, I applauded, and I believe if we were at war again and uh, we had introduced that weapon, I would rejoice. I also think in rejoicing, uh, I was doing what the rest of the country was doing because none of us knew what atomic energy was. We didn't know about radiation. We just knew there was a weapon that was going to end the war. When the news came, there were just it, millions of American soldiers whose thought was, I'm going to live. Yeah. I'm going to live. There's a future. This war is over. 
The worst legacy of World War II is the civilian as target. It's the legacy that we've lived with for 50 years. And not even gone today, even with the demise of the Soviet Union, Russia still has tens of thousands of nuclear tipped missiles, and the civilian is still the target. You were a target. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about it? What it's like yeah, to be well, at the other end? And you, were, you weren't the target, but you were in the city, know, so you were the target. No, well, I, I've known people. You were doing work for the German economy, so you were the target. And, and yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> there was, so were a hell of a lot of Poles and Yugoslavs and, and Dutchmen and Frenchmen and English, Englishmen and Yugosla uh, Yugoslavians and so forth. And so, as a way of revenge, you know, in order for it to succeed, it, it should have killed me too. If everybody would be that bad at, at the Germans, they would have killed me too. I, there have been technical studies which proves that, they, that such bombings did almost nothing to stop German production, did almost nothing to uh, weaken the German war effort. And you would think it, uh, uh, it would have done a hell of a lot. Uh, I, well, when I finally got out uh, and was shipped home with my war buddy, who'd gone through it together, with two of us had gone through it. He became a district attorney. He was already pretty well educated. And I said, what did you learn? And he said, not to believe my government. Because we had believed up to that time, and been given to believe, that we weren't bombing civilians. As in the newsreels, we had two bomb sites. One was the Sperry bomb site, and the other was Norden. Which one did you use? I, I think they were the same bomb site. I think Nord, Norden merged with Sperry. Well, anyway, there would be pictures on the newsreels of a guy with the with the bomb site, with a couple of MPs, yeah, <laughs> with drawn 45s because the Japanese and the Germans were so eager to get these weapons, and uh, we claimed it's probably true we could uh, drop bombs down the smokestacks of factories or whatever, and then, by God, we saw Britain and the United States simply <coughs> carpet carpet bombs a city, and it, and it was. Uh, it was not well known that we were doing that, that that was our policy, is simply to kill and kill and kill civilians to see if we couldn't win the war that way. Uh, as far as, I had, a, somebody sent me a, a bombardier's gazetteer, or bombardier's something, it was alternate targets. Yeah, oh, that, that was, Nagasaki was an alternate yeah, target. Yeah, but the, uh, they listed the, the guy showed it to me, and you know, if you can't drop your bombs on Cam Chemnitz or whatever, uh, and you're over Dresden, and it said what was there. This was before Dresden was hit. And you know, there's a gas company, <laughs> there's a water plant, uh, and they had, the Germans had purposely kept it with, without any military targets, and the, they said that it was done to interdict the railroad system, well, it's very easy to, ra to lay track, as the city was a ruin. But by God, they had tracks <laughs> laid. And Just like Sherman in the Civil War. Yeah. They could repair those tracks as the Confederates tore up the next mm -hmm. day. And that, the bombing bridges was much more effective. Bombing what? Bridges. Oh, yeah. Uh, you knock a bridge out, you can't just lay a new track over it. And that's a different matter altogether. And they did manage to knock off all the bridges on the Seine. On the Dresden raid, there are a lot of charges made. And one is they just run out of targets. Another yeah, is that yeah. they wanted to show, the RAF and the AAF wanted to show the world, and specifically the Russians, the power of the American air arm. It's argued that Hap Arnold and others felt, we're going to pull this army out of Europe when this war is over, just like we did in 1919. And that's going to leave the Red Army here. And we got to show those guys what we can do with our heavy bombers, and they're about to come into Dresden. Well, and so we'll, we'll give them a demonstration of what air power can do. But of course, what air power can do is terrorize civilians in, when it's used in that way. I mean, the, the fighter bombers hitting specific targets is another matter altogether, you know, flying down low and helping the ground troops out. Yeah. It, 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 from, from those B-17s, 
and the, and the British war engines that were at Dresden, it, it, if they came within 2,000 yards of the aiming point, they called it a hit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the aiming point for Dresden was a soccer stadium. Yeah. It's when you saw the soccer stadium, let your bombs go. Uh, but I, I talked to Freeman Dyson, who was an RAF bureaucrat, and then is now at the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton, and is a great physicist. Uh, and he said, that it was surely, it was simply bureaucratic momentum. It's people yeah, yeah, that's come right. to work, they're, they're, that's exactly. what are we going to do today? Yeah. We've got this huge Air Force over here, yeah. and we don't have any targets left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, but I, I, it was a shame, and, and what I've said, and I'll say this audience again, but I've said it everywhere in the world, that not one concentration camp prisoner got out a microsecond earlier. He's not one German soldier retreated from his defensive position a microsecond earlier. There's only one pers on, person on the whole face of the earth who benefited from the firebombing of Dresden. He is sitting before you now. I got five dollars for each person killed. That's it. You have to explain how you got the five dollars. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a book about the firebombing of Dresden. Yeah, but I, nobody has ever come forward. I, I was with William Styron, and you don't want to travel with him, because we were, we were in Japan together, and he said on television that he thanked God for the atomic bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, several Japanese came up to him later and said they felt the same way, that they would have, they too would have been dead if it weren't for the atomic bomb. I think unquestionably the atomic bomb saved hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Japanese lives. Hap Arnold was laying on 800 and 900 and 1,000 B-29 raids on firebombing Tokyo, firebombing all the other cities, and it was going to be continuous right through the summer. And there's just no question the atomic bomb saved an awful lot of Japanese lives. At the beginning of the war, Franklin Roosevelt took the lead in denouncing the bombing of cities and called on all of the nations at war to renounce it and to swear that they wouldn't do it. We got into the war and Roosevelt became the number one advocate of bomb the holy hell out of them and hit them and hit them and hit them again and terrorize them and force them to quit. And it's like the war against Iraq. You carry the war to the civilians, it isn't going to affect the Republican guards. It isn't going to affect the frontline troops. You starve out Japan, it's not the Japanese army that's going to starve. It's the Japanese people that are going to starve. You bomb Tokyo, you're not going to kill the Japanese army. You're going to be killing Japanese civilians. Do either of you want to take, or both of you want to take a little wrap-up, and then we can go to questions from the audience? Yeah, I, I want to tell you what I was doing on D-Day, but we got away from it. <laughs> I, I was flying a mission on D-Day, and that was in this lovely spring and summer of the Mediterranean. And we would take off, and then I would turn on the radio to listen to the Armed Force radio. And I, I think I was listening to the score from Oklahoma, which had opened. Uh, and, and, then, uh, and, and, and another. He means the play, not the football team. Yeah. And, and, and a song from another musical called Louisiana Hayride by Cole Porter, and then the Bolton came on that they landed in, in Normandy and they opened the second front. And I will tell you how young and ignorant I was. I had no idea where Normandy was. I knew that sooner or later there would be a second front. Being an optimist, I felt whatever we did would succeed. Uh, we would do it to be successful and successful uh, without any trouble. And, and that was the D-Day the, the experience for me. I told you what the bulge was watching him in snow, uh, seeing the stars and stripes, uh, 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 seeing, seeing the photographs of that. I also remember there was a city in Normandy called C-A-E-N, Caen. And that was apparently very important because the news stories in Stars and Stripes would be con. They were supposed to capture it within a few hours, and it took three, four, or six weeks. I don't know I, what... No, actually, it took eight weeks. But eight weeks. Yeah. 
uh, and I had no idea what the, uh, the importance was, but another thing that struck me is that I don't believe that any of the soldiers who were fighting, now maybe the upper generals who had a, a view of strategy knew it, but I don't believe that any of the infantry men, the artillery men, knew any more about it than I did. They, they, in, in fact, they, they possibly knew less. They didn't know they were going to Khan. They were saying, take a hill. Most infantrymen will tell you, my war was 20 yards this way and 20 yards yeah. that way. And I can tell you about that. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, 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 there was a panel about a month and a half ago at the University of South Carolina. And I was there and James Dickey, uh, Paul Fussell, who had been wounded in the invasion of southern France, William Manchester, who had been wounded very seriously in Okinawa, the, the, the woman writer, Mary Lee Settle, was there. She had been in, in the Royal Air Force, and then when she broke down, she was in the OWIA. Uh, OWI in England. And at a certain point, we were all talking about experience. At a certain point, she said, you know, listening to us talk here, it's as though we were in different wars. Because none of our stories had anything to do, none of our experience had anything to do with the experience of anybody else. And yet it was the same war. Yeah, just looking at you two, uh, the airmen are back at these bases that you wrote so wonderfully about. And then they, the long flights, especially coming out of England going over North Germany, but in the Mediterranean as well, these long, boring flights with that drone of the engineer, and then these moments of absolute sheer shark terror. And then the flight back, if you survive, the infantryman in the Battle of the Bulge is living in a foxhole in the ground. It gets dark at 4.30 in the afternoon, gets light at 8.30 in the morning, and it's below zero weather, and you don't have on proper clothes, and you can't light a fire, and you can't have a cigarette, and you can't go to sleep. And it goes on and on and on, and it just gets to be god-awful. Paul Fusel, you just mentioned, talks about, and you guys had gotten onto this a little bit earlier, going into battle, the young soldier thinks to himself, it can't happen to me. I'm too good looking. I'm too well trained. I'm too important. And then after a period of time, it might be a day, might be a week, might be a month. It could happen to me if I'm not more careful, if I don't dig my foxhole deeper, if I don't hold my fire and quit revealing my position. And then finally, after another period of time, the realization comes, it's going to happen to me. If I'm here, well, I'm the only way I can, the only way I can escape it is to either lose a limb or lose my life. Otherwise, it's going to happen to me. I believe you mentioned in D Day that there was a general feeling to use to, to hold back troops with experience. Those who had had experience in North Africa or in Italy, there was a general feeling in the high command not to use them in the in normal invasion because they knew what to expect, and the soldiers who had never been in combat had that same feeling that I had in the one Fossil mentioned. It can happen to me, and it's an adventure. One of, one of the rangers I interviewed said, you know, a, a, an experienced infantryman is a terrified infantryman. Kurt, before we go to questions, do you want to have a, another go at... Well, I... I I think the celebrations of, of VE Day are, are largely about victories. In my war, uh, it was a steady humiliation, is a, a disgrace. Uh, there was no high point where I, where I accomplished <laughs> something. Uh, and uh, I've since become a connoisseur of defeats. Well, one thing I, <laughs> I one thing I saw is I saw. The, uh, I saw the German army on the run from the Russians. As I saw the German army in defeat and disorder, and then saw the Russians come in. Because it was a while before I got back to uh, American zone. And I, then I went to Biafra and watched the Ebos in a state of defeat. And then I went to Mozambique and so, saw the, the people there defeated. And I think, you know, one trouble with pop literature is it teaches people, they're full of success stories, how you can succeed. And what we all le need lessons in is how to behave when defeated, because that's what's going to happen. <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> okay, we have some microphones set up, and I know there are a lot of people with a lot of questions, and I'm not quite clear on how we're going to run this. Where are those microphones? Right there behind the camera. If people want to get up to that microphone and, and, and line up and uh, begin the asking of questions. And you, you repeat the question. Sorry about that. For anybody with a loud voice. Why did it take so long to write the two books we've been talking about tonight? Um, the process of digesting your experiences and being able to talk to everyone else about it. This is a question for writers. Why did it take you so long to write these books, the Slaughterhouse-Five and the Catch-22? Well, why, why, why did Norman Mailer get out right away? Well, I'll tell you who was out first, and he's going to be your guest of honor tomorrow at lunch. Andy Rooney. It's five minutes after the war was over, Andy Rooney handed in the manuscript for a book called Tail Gunner. I don't know whether, <laughs> <laughs> but whether it's going to be, whether you'll be able to get copies to put on that table out there. <laughs> anyway, the question is, why did it take you so long to write? Because I wanted to do it right, and I had seen an event of, of obviously uh, very important, having been the largest massacre in European history. And of course, people always say, well, what about the Holocaust? And uh, I'm talking about killing people in a hurry, is what you mean by a massacre. And uh, it's interesting is that the best number is 135,000. And the town was full of refugees because it was believed safe. Uh, and also uh, wounded soldiers and so forth. And so they don't know really how many people were there when it was bombed. It, it took me so long. Uh, because I didn't decide to, to, to become a novelist until I was 30 years old, which was uh, seven or eight years after I was out of the army. And then it turns out I'm a very, 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 very slow writer. <laughs> so, the so, slowest in history, may I say. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, that was not by choice. It was not until 1961 that uh, uh, Catch-22 was finished and, and uh, ready to be manufactured and introduced. I don't. Ch I didn't choose to. T I don't choose to be a slow writer. I wish I could write a novel as fast as Andy Rooney did. <laughs> but also uh, the attitudes. I did not know enough after World War II to to write a novel about anything. Most of the sensibility and the attitudes that are in Catch-22 came from the post-World War. They don't really reflect my own experiences of Catch-22, apart from the uh, literal physical events. Dresden was a secret for a long time. As I wrote the Air Force historian saying, you know, I'd been there and it looked pretty interesting what I'd seen. And uh, what was the point of it? And what did you achieve your military goal and all that? And it was top secret. This was years after the war. Top secret from who? From the Russians were there. The Germans certainly noticed it. <coughs> and so did all other Europeans. It was secret from the American people because it, it was something uh, the American people couldn't be proud of. The Brits talked about it. And uh, there was recently a big debate on whether Bomber Harris, the only, is the only marshal to come through the war with, and not get a VC at the end of it, Victoria Cross. And the Brits felt that much of what he did was immoral, bombing civilian populations. And so very recently, in the last three few years, there's a debate on whether this man deserved a statue or not. There was no such debate in the United States. But I must say that also what Freeman Dyson, again, the Englishman who was the RAF bureaucrat, said, is I was right to make it seem like an American operation. It was mainly a British operation is they did the fire bombing is, is uh, we just <coughs> dropped some high explosive to make kindling. Next. Uh, yes, I have a, a question for both writers. Uh, the Second World War had um, a rather major effect on uh, ideology and ideas, uh, especially having to do with anti-Semitism and uh, anti-black uh, opinion in the United States. Uh, is that only after the fact, or did you notice anything during the war that uh, had to do with those subjects? You mentioned the Holocaust. Uh, 
Could you tell during the war that um, opinions were going to be different about anti-Semitism and uh, segregation? Uh, I, number one, I could. Number two, I, I would question the, the, uh, the assumption uh, in your question that it was the Second World War that had much to do with the, the decline, what I would I experience as a decline of anti-Semitism in this country, or the increased uh, uh, recognition of the rights of black. Uh, I can't right now, as I'm talking to you, see that as a cause and effect situation. And what Kurt? about Mr. Vonnegut? Uh, well, I agree with Joe. He, he's awfully smart. <laughs> I, uh, I, I was, well, no, I grew up in the part of, of, of a community in Indianapolis, which, which wasn't anti-Semitic and wasn't, wasn't anti-black. And, and uh, so there was no revolution in my family, and I think that there were so many people like, like my family in Indianapolis that, that uh, finally they were able to uh, make us a better country, uh, a better treatment of minorities. I think it was the American people, it was just the conscience of the American people that made it come about, not the Second World War. Well, it helped. Yeah, democracies respond to crises. The first integration of the United States Army took place in the battle that you were in, and they were they just were desperately short of riflemen, and I put out an invitation to black truck drivers and stevedores. I'll bring you in the line, and I'll put you in with organized squads and platoons and companies on an integrated basis if you'll give up your stripes and come on in. In other words, for the privilege of fighting for their country, they could give up their stripes and have that privilege, and thousands and thousands of them did, and that was the beginning of the integration of the United States Army. It was a response to a crisis. We just absolutely had to have them. Next. Uh, first, I'd like to say how impressed I am to see the two writers that I admired most in graduate school at the same time at the same place. But I have a question for Mr. Vonnegut. I visited Dresden two years ago. I'm curious if you have been back since German reunification. I know you were there in 67. Yeah, no, I, I haven't wanted to go back, and, and uh, I don't think I'll ever want to go back now because they are restoring the Frauenkirche. And what the Virgin Mary made it through the firestorm and was still up on top of it. Uh, they made it through the firestorm and was still up on top of a, of a, a plug of masonry. And I thought it was a perfect uh, memorial, monument to two world wars, is, is uh, Western civilizations trying twice to commit suicide and uh, in an ideal location too being uh, in the middle of Europe it, it's close to uh, the Slavic nations and so what I protested about the restoration of the Frauenkirche it's going to be just brand new and again I think it was like the bombing it was just bureaucratic momentum what are we going to do <laughs> tomorrow let's, let's rebuild the, the, the church next Hi. I'd like to ask both of you about the future. What do you see for the future? Do you see another war? Do you see the same kind of madness? That's wide open. Uh, again, when you use the word madness, uh, I'm not sure what you refer to. That, that, wars, that the wars break out on such, such a large scale as the First World War and the Second War is... Uh, it, it, it's, Irrational, an irrational event in the, in the progress of, situ, uh, of civilization. But to use the word madness uh, to, in such a general sense doesn't discriminate uh, between the ambitions of Hitler's Germany, let's say, and our response to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uh, I don't like war. I hate war. It's atrocious. I, I can't... I, uh, I can't contemplate. But the use of, of that word madness, it seems to me that the response of this country to the bombing of Pearl Harbor was a very rational and, and, and necessary response. Uh, what do I see for the future? I think another war is inevitable. I think terrorists will get atomic weapons and they will use them indiscriminately 
uh, when they can. But uh, I, I'm not worried about it because I'm 72 years old. <laughs> I, I am an optimistic with a very pessimistic viewpoint for the future, and I tried to put that in my last novel. Uh, I'm very, I'm very, very happy to finish the novel. Uh, Kathy O'Sarin is very happy because he's going to keep a date with the woman he's involved in. But the world is going to come to an end, and if it doesn't come to an end because of a governmental activity, it'll come to an end in two billion years when the sun burns out. So sooner or later, we're not going to be around. That's my feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're so well known for your collapsing and expanding of time and the way you move around time in your novels. Uh, do you want to talk on this one? What, what does the future hold for us? No, I, I'm so... I gave up lecturing for a while. I, I was so depressing to myself. <laughs> I... <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think the news isn't good. I, I think that, uh, uh, that we are destroying the planet as a uh, life support system without, uh, without having to have a war. That's all. And I, I'm puzzled by how few people are involved in ecological movements or in peace movements. It's my suspicion that most people don't like being alive. <laughs> they are embarrassed. They are embarrassed. They're not great lovers. Is you know their feet are too big. They can't dance. And they, their teeth are crooked and everything. And I think life is embarrassing to almost everybody. <laughs> and they would just as soon end. Now another thing. I I don't want to be part of a species that was capable of Auschwitz. I just. I, I, we have to totally well, I, 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 I Don't you want to be part of a species that is responsible for Beethoven? I'll swap him for Auschwitz any time, yeah. <laughs> but it's the same species. Oh, I was talking about the human... I know, I was talking about the human race, not the Germans. The Germans are wonderful people, don't you know that? <laughs> I, no, I, I, I... No, I just... The human race is... Uh, I mean... I, I have to disagree. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with you every, uh, every, up to a point. Uh, I like being alive. Most of the people I know like being alive. But uh, I don't think that's the cause of it. I, I think there's something evolutionary in, in the progress of civilization. I think we've reached our peak. I agree with you on the environment. But I have the feeling that there's nothing anybody can do to change the course of uh, the, the, course, the course of human history there is no politician in this country that can do it uh, rationally we should protect the environment but uh, it's one of the failures i think of uh, a democratic republic society and there's none other i prefer to it but one of the failures is that it reaches a point at which intelligent action becomes impossible and I think we're in that stage now. This doesn't feel good. Yeah, the, no. you're saying the news is bad. Uh, Not for you and me, Kurt, because we're 72 years old. Yeah, I mean, I've got grandchildren, and uh, they're certainly on my mind. And uh, uh, I got a daughter right over here. She's 12 years old, and, and so I'd like the planet to last a little beyond your lifetime, if you don't mind. I will support you in that, but I just wonder <laughs> what anybody can do, individual or even in groups, to, to, to affect those changes that would uh, increase the odds. Uh, on, on, on preservation and self-preservation. Well, I'm saving all my cans now, and, and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but let me ask you guys to respond to this. Now, with all this gloom and doom, here we are, five years short of the 21st century, less than five now, and it appears quite probable that the 21st century is going to be the democratic century. 
that this war that started in 1939 at a time when it looked like totalitarianism was going to take over this world, whether it was of the right or the left, or Japanese militarism form of totalitarianism, looked like a sure winner in 1939. And think of what's happened in the 60 or a little bit less of years since. And we are moving into a 21st century that could well be the democratic century. It, it, uh, that, it's very hard to believe in progress if you've lived through World War II, World War I and II. But now that we're at the end of the century, isn't there room for optimism and an idea that maybe there, that idea that we started this century with, that there is progress in human affairs, may be true? You, you, you think democratic societies, particularly our own, uh, as we progress and as we become uh, predominant in, in the Western world, you think they are becoming more efficient in, at governing or more efficient in their political no, system? No, it's the nature of democracy to be inefficient. But one thing about democracy, because they, people squabble all the time, except if there's a crisis that everybody has to face. You're absolutely right about that. But that, another point of that is that democracies, generally speaking, do not make war. Except against the Indians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm in over my head, folks. I'm in. <laughs> Next question. Is there somebody back there at the mic? Next question. Oh, Mr. Vonnegut, a couple of questions. I've often wondered since I read your novel, the character, Edgar Derby, who was summarily shot for looting a teapot after the bombing, was that a, a real-life character? Yes, that really happened. His name was Mike Palea, and he was from Philadelphia. Yeah, that really happened, and it's interesting. You know, our labor detail there in Dresden was 100, and we suffered the normal casualties for prisoners in the, uh, in the hands of the Germans, which is 3%. Uh, three of us got killed, and um, three of us died. I read somewhere the numbers for those in the hands of Japanese, and you know, it's up about 28% or something like that. Oh, Mr. Bungard, another, another question, sir. Uh, can you uh, give us your sensation when you went into the slaughterhouse and you realized that there was a bombing raid and, and you left a beautiful, pristine, Baroque German city on the surface, went below the bombing raid, and then you, uh, I saw this movie this afternoon, by the way, which I thought recreated very well, but the sensation of seeing that pristine, beautiful Baroque city going underground, experiencing the bombing from that point, going up, opening the door and seeing a moonscape. Can, can you recreate this for this crowd, please? Well, you've described it pretty well. And, and uh, <laughs> I... <laughs> no, it's a... It's a, it's a completely... It's a passive experience, as we were... There were no air raid shelters except ordinary cellars in Dresden because they weren't expecting to be bombed. We happened to be quartered in a slaughterhouse where maybe a hundred years ago they had dug out these uh, deep tunnels for keeping meat a little cool, uh, preserving meat for a little longer. And so when we got down there, and that was the best air raid shelter in Dresden, we could hear the sticks of bombs walking overhead. You know, it's over us again. And uh, it was a whitewashed ceiling and, and flakes of, of a calcimine. Would, getting our hair and all that. Uh, and we couldn't tell what the hell was going on. And we were, the guards made us stay right where we were. And they would go up and look and, and come back. And I mean, they were, the whole city was on fire and we didn't see the city in that condition. Uh, and finally, they decided it was safe for us to come out and that was when we first saw it. And we were the only, people around, and ever so often we'd see logs about this long. These were people who'd been caught up, <laughs> caught up on the surface, and all the oxygen had been consumed by, uh, by a firestorm. There's one great column of fire uh, done on purpose, mainly by the Brits. Uh, but while we were walking out, 
Uh, and yeah, indeed, we did see all the buildings knocked down. Uh, there's a couple of fighter planes, American fighter planes, came after us, just seeing somebody still alive uh, down there. And uh, just a couple of young kids, I guess, having fun and, and raising hell and uh, open fire on us. They missed. But I was, I've been attacked. I've been attacked by the British Air Force, the American Air Force, and the Russian Air Force. And, they <laughs> and, and by a couple of other critics. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You didn't hear that one. And by a couple of literary critics, too, he's been attacked. <laughs> Next question. Since our time in school is so, so limited, and our children grow up quickly, uh, is that, um, what about World War II? Um, would both of you writers, uh, well, three of you writers, like to see taught in the schools about World War II to our children and, uh, and college students? I, I didn't hear. She wants to know what you would want to have taught about World War II to your grandchildren. Yes, to your children. And great grandchildren were getting that far along now. Uh, go ahead. It, 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 I, I don't have an easy answer for that one. It's a very uh, it's a very complicated situation. I, w I question myself uh, in, in this area. If I were an adult in 1936, 7 or 8, whether I would have been su supported FDR and the administration in, in their impulse to support Great Britain. Uh, because every war since then, uh, I've been opposed to every war that this country has been in. I don't know how I would have felt. I don't know what the rationale was for World War II. All I know is this, that until Pearl Harbor, it would have been very hard to get a declaration of war in this country, uh, despite the, the support we were giving to Britain, and despite the, the, the hostility and antagonism I had toward Hitler, and fascism. After Pearl Harbor, it became very simple. Then it seemed to become a question one of national necessity, uh, 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 national prestige, and national survival, and it seemed to become a question of, of right and wrong. Uh, I, I would not know what to say about World War II other than that. And what I'm saying now, I would not want to see taught because it would raise questions and possibly teach. Uh, encourage a certain kind of skepticism, which I myself don't feel. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, it, it would be for a hobbyist, I think, someone deeply interested in, uh, in war, uh, to dig up materials and, and uh, form an opinion. I, I, don't think, I don't think the World War II can be taught as a lesson that the whole country learns. Is this, finally, war is nonsense. Uh, and to make sense of it uh, uh, is doing students a disservice. Well, well I would teach is that something like 40 million people perished in World War II. Uh, 300,000 Americans uh, died. There was a million casualties. The Russians lost 20 or 25 million people. A whole <coughs> German generation was wiped out. Uh, uh, it was a a human calamity. The way, the way I would teach it, do, I guess, is that Hitler was crushed. What? Hitler was crushed. Uh, Tojo and the Japanese militarists were crushed. And it wasn't a, a, a pure victory for democracy because our indispensable partner was another totalitarian state. But the crushing of Nazi Germany and militarist Japan was a case of justice being served at a very great cost. And I would also teach about World War II that it shows what a democracy can do when everybody agrees on the objective, which almost never happens in a democracy. That's why it is a democracy. People don't agree. But if they do ever come together and agree, what democracy can accomplish, what the British democracy did in 1940? The French democracy crumbled. What the British democracy did in 1940 and what the American democracy did after December 7th of 41, to turn out goods and weapons and soldiers and airmen and sailors, 
that were superior to those who had been at this game since 1930, at this war since 38, 39, 37 in the Japanese case, I think the lesson in World War II is don't ever despair of democracy. You, you, you're proud to say You're, you're focusing on just one democracy in your argument, which is the American democracy. Uh, England could not have survived, uh, 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 French democracy failed, and there, there were German democracy failed uh, before Hitler. Uh, I, I think you're attributing to uh, our political system very much that could be the credit that belongs to our industrial capacity and a national will, which did not coalesce into anything of a unified nature until Pearl Harbor. A question that's come up a couple of times, now you may have the answer to it, is number one, why did Hitler declare war on this country after Pearl Harbor, and what would have happened if he had not declared war? Now for those of you who are younger than I am, Germany declared war on this country before we declared war on Germany. Now, the sequence of events was on the 7th of December, the Japanese attack on the morning of the 8th, Franklin Roosevelt asked for a declaration of war against the Japanese Empire, which passed the Congress with one dissenting vote. Three days later, on December 11th, Adolf Hitler declared war on the United States. Joe, it is the most inexplicable of all his crazy decisions. Mm -hmm. It was also the loneliness, the loneliest of all his lonely decisions. He consulted no one. You would think if you were going to declare war on the United States, you would ask the Minister of War, you would ask your top generals, you would ask your admirals, you would ask your foreign minister, hey, what do you think, guys? <laughs> not Adolf. He didn't ask anybody, he just did it. He was not required to do it. The pact that he had with Japan was a mutual defense pact. The Japanese didn't come to his aid. You talk of one of the great what ifs of this century. What if the Japanese had attacked out of, uh, into Siberia in the summer of 1941? But they didn't. Hitler didn't know them anything. There's, we don't know why he did it. He just did it. Let me ask you another question, which would be guesswork. If Hitler had not declared war in this country, do you think Roosevelt could have gotten a declaration of war against Germany or would even have sought one? There was great consternation in the War Department and wringing of hands on the 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th of December till the word came through because they, they had already planned that uh, Europe first uh, was we're going to fight this two front war. And suddenly we weren't at war in Europe. We were only at war in Japan and all the plans were worthless. I don't, I don't know. Roosevelt was later to say that he felt that since Germany and Japan were allies that we would willy-nilly get into that war with Germany and of course he was pushing it in the Atlantic very hard with the undeclared war that was taking place secretly but under his orders and that he felt that Hitler would sooner or later have to respond to that. I, but I agree with you, I don't think he could have gotten a declaration of war against Germany. People wanted to go after the Japanese. Yeah. And, and you hear about a lot of GIs in Europe saying, what the hell are we over here for? It was the Japanese that did it to us. One guy socks you in the nose and you turn and fight the other guy. That didn't make any sense. Uh, another thing I want to add from my personal experience, I can't recall, I was in the Army for three years, overseas, 10 months. I can't really recall a discussion in the barracks about the merits of the war, uh, whether we should be fighting, should be fighting. I can't recall any hatred for Germany or Hitler. We, we went to the army and we talked about the same things we would have been talking about if we were home in our neighborhood in one of our cellar clubs. Next. Yeah. Um, this is maybe a little off the subject, but I've been feeling, I don't know if you've been following local news, Mr. Vonnegut and Mr. Heller, but I've been feeling lately like we're under invasion right now here in the city. And some of the technology of the invasion can be seen at night through all the laser lights that are flashing over the French Quarter and so on. And you know, not that this has directly anything to do with World War II, but I'm just wondering whether maybe a peaceful invasion of democracy could do it more damage than actually an invasion that involves guns. You know, I, I, I just don't know what to make of it. It's baffling to me, and I was wondering what your thoughts on this subject were. Uh, I think I know what you're referring to. I didn't hear it at all. I, I think it baffles a very 
great many of us, uh, and it may have to do with what we call mass culture. Uh, I'm, I'm, as I say this, I'm, I'm recalling a remark that H.L. Mencken once made once, uh, I'll misquote him, but it's, nobody ever went broke by underestimating the vulgarity of the American people. <laughs> uh, In fact, and, they make a lot of money by estimating I, I, I think what, what we're seeing is a, a steady erosion, a, a degrading uh, in taste, uh, in objectives from, from television uh, and newspapers uh, and magazines. There was a, an increasing appeal to what has been called the lowest common denominator. Uh, we are, have been obsessed uh, by the O.J. Simpson trial until the Oklahoma bombing. It doesn't seem to matter what the sensation of, of the week is, the newspapers and the television will focus on it. And we seem to have, by we, and I don't mean just the Americans, because what's popular in the U.S. becomes popular in England and the continent. Uh, we, we seem to have a, a, an insatiable need for entertainment. Uh, I think one of the biggest growth industries in this country, after pornography and armaments, uh, is, is, is the entertainment industry. Uh, this, everybody has a VCR. People who don't have <laughs> who don't have three meals a day, they, they have a, they have television and they have a, they have a video recorder. The, the idea it stuns me. The idea that these prize fighters have a championship match and make from 10 to 30 to 40 million dollars for one prize fight is just inconceivable. It was, uh, it, I, I cannot believe it, I can't imagine it, and I know, I know it's true. Uh, and I, I think that's pretty much what you're referring to when you talk about the invasion of, uh, of, of technology. So much of it centers on the uh, uh, field of entertainment. Kurt? No, I, there's all this talk of, about the communication systems in place already for the superhighway and all that. There's almost no talk about this network up here to receive the signals and what it may be doing to them. And I think it's quite possible that uh, the signals we're receiving are, are uh, bad for us. But again, I'm completely fatalistic. I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine any way to stop it, particularly as a, as a supporter of the American Civil Liberties Union. Right. Uh, but I, uh, well, hell, life is tragic and, and uh, yeah, but a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, it goes back to what I said. I, I think you, you, you're coming close to what I said uh, several minutes ago. We can deplore many things, and almost everybody will deplore them, including the people who watch the O.J. Simpson case who love to see Madonna in a vizier, uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and the ones, ones who get tired of it. My feeling is that nobody can do anything about it. Do you, I, I, I'm stuck here just... The O.J. Simpson case, which is... I, I knew it was going to come up tonight. It comes up everywhere. <laughs> But now you, you guys are the novelists. You're the ones that, that, that put this together for us and show us how to think about these events. Is this the end of American civilization, this O.J. Simpson trial? <laughs> is this no, a total it's, collapse that's happening in front of our eyes with Judge Ito standing up there listening well, to the blood test? The total collapse of our self-respect, I think, is that is it, we really can't like ourselves. Again, we don't want to live anymore. Is it? Uh, <laughs> but you want to live. To, you want to live to see it go to the jury, don't you? you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's going to walk, as everybody knows that. Is that okay? It? Next. Good evening. Um, you mentioned something earlier. I think it was Mr. Vonnegut about uh, one of the things that maybe the war taught you was never to trust your government. Uh, lately, we've heard a lot about McNamara's book about Vietnam and the mistakes that uh, this country made there, at least at the high leadership level, and basically renouncing what, what all we did there. And wanted to hear maybe some of your thoughts on that. Well, I, you've got to realize that some people are crazy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, I mean, they, they're evenly distributed throughout the, 
the population, and he's cracked. <laughs> it's only, only a nut would do what he did, and nobody will say so. Is this man has... has <laughs> He has, he has no conscience, and, and just because his disease hasn't been named doesn't mean he's got, he doesn't have one. You want to comment on McNamara? Uh, I think far back, uh, when Eisenhower was president, I came in the penalty idea that don't trust what the government said, and it had to do with the U-2 incident. Uh, it's the first in my memory, although people who lived in the 20s probably can find other ones. The Russians claimed they shot down an American spy plane, of which we'd never heard was called the U-2. And uh, Eisenhower went on television radio and said, it's a lie, there's no such thing, it didn't happen. Then a week later, the Russians released films of this man, Gary Powers was his name, and it was, it was an American pilot, and he had been flying sp a, a sp a spy missions at a very extraordinary altitude. And I wondered, I raised the questions that Kirk wondered about Dresden. Who was this lie intended to deceive? The Russians knew it was true, and they were our enemies. They would tell all the other communist countries it was true. Uh, they, they knew it was so Who didn't know it? That, that, that they didn't want to know it. And among the people they didn't want to know it was the American population. I, I think that's been repeated a dozen times since, and I have the cynical attitude. Any time there's a difference of opinion between our government, official news source, and some nation that's considered antagonistic to us, uh, I, I, I tend to believe the facts of the other person, uh, uh, the, the other guy. And, and usually it, it does turn out to be true. The Libya raid was, was another example of during the Gulf War when they the bomb hit this, this bomb shelter. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. The, the Gulf of Tonkin inci incident uh, was, was another one. Uh, in, in, in my latest novel, uh, toward the end, people are in a bomb shelter and there's an official announcer. And, and he says, since all, all the news you receive will come from official sources, you have no reason to believe any of it. <laughs> so we won't give you any news. <laughs> Next. I found your remarks about um, whether or not this country, uh, after the, had, whether or not after the Pearl Harbor was bombed, if we had not declared war on Germany, uh, whether or not it uh, would have made any difference. I mean, we knew who our mortal enemy was. We knew it many years in advance. At what? We who knew who our mortal enemy, enemy was. was, the primary. They were all our enemies, but we knew the primary one. Well, I was 10 years old in 1933 when Hitler came to power. My folks, my folks living in Gretna at the time, who were from Europe, knew this was very bad. And, and of course, there was no sympathy for Hindenburg, who was president at the time, but he was forced to put Hitler in the office. We knew it was a sad time. And in 1936, I recall crossing the ferry as a 13-year-old, going back home after being downtown in New Orleans, reading the afternoon paper. I, I, I didn't say anything uh, that contradicts what you're saying now. Uh, my remark had to do only with the political decision and whether Roosevelt could have gotten a declaration of war from the U.S. Congress if Hitler had not declared war on this country first? I believe, and I remember the events very well, we're about the same age. I recall the isolationism in this country, particularly by senators in the Midwest. Maybe it was a Senator Norris, and maybe one of the names. I don't recall all the names. There was a strong sentiment for isolations, not yeah. so getting other people's wars. But however, we know the momentum. We saw in New Orleans, we I uh, are, are you saying that Roosevelt would have gone to war with a declaration of war against Germany? He was, Ger th this country was directly... Wait a minute. Let, you can answer my question with a yes or no. Uh, are, are you saying that Roosevelt would have gone to Congress for a declaration of war against Germany if there had not been Pearl Harbor? 
I believe if there had been no Pearl Harbor, we'd end it in the war at, its, at a slightly later date. There's no doubt about it. The problem, the problem with that, though, is at what later date and on what well, incident and how Roosevelt had pushed Hitler as hard as he possibly could in the North Atlantic and Hitler had wisely refrained from declaring war. Hitler was at the gates of Moscow. Would, and, uh, it, would the fall of Moscow have compelled Roosevelt to ask for a declaration of war against Germany before they get too powerful, or would he have continued his very cautious policies of appeasing the appeasers, of uh, kowtowing to the isolationists? Would the isolationists have said, oh my God, Moscow's fallen, we better get into this war? Those people were violently anti-communist. They were more anti-communist than they were anti-Nazi. The fall of Moscow, they would have cheered. Do you recall the German American? Well, at what point would when, that declaration? I can't of war tell you. Come? I can't declare or predict what point we're headed in that direction. You, you, no you, we, we, we think we should thank the British I think people you're for saving the, this country. You're using the word "should," where I use the word "would." Okay, I'm going to call this one off, and we've got time for one more question. Yeah. There's somebody well, behind you. I'm sorry, but that's all the time we have on that. I'd like one. to talk with you later, Professor. That's At a later fine. date, I'd like to talk with you. That's fine. Thank you. Yes. Okay, last question. Yes, sir. Mr. Vonnegut, in your brilliant novel, Bluebeard, uh, the female character merrily condemns the glorifying of war and of war heroes, um, and she tells the protagonist that she believes men are just pretending to, uh, they're playing war against themselves. It's actually uh, against all women. I was wondering if you agreed with her position or where you um, came up with that perspective. I don't remember the book. <laughs> can, can we end on that? <laughs> I vote. <laughs> I, I don't think that one can be to can be topped, and we have kept these we've kept these old veterans up here at work for two straight hours now, and it's been a wonderful time, a, a great evening for New Orleans, a great evening for the Eisenhower Center. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Joe.